Welcome to my Bob Thurman podcast. I'm so grateful some good friends enabled me to present them to you. If you enjoy them and find them useful, please think of becoming a member of Tibet House U.S. to help preserve Tibetan culture. Tibet House is the Dalai Lama's cultural center in America. All best wishes. Have a great day. This episode is titled, Debut, The Story of My Early Years. Now, I thought I would therefore talk about myself and be personal. Instead of, I mean, I've done a few, said a few things, but I would talk about myself. I, I, uh, I was born in Manhattan Island, which is a really weird place to be born. And in my entire life, I have moved from the east side to the west side. <laughs> and I uh, hated the English alphabet. And I hated writing A, 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 B, 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 C, C, C across the page like that. And my English writing sucks, therefore. And I only discovered when I finally discovered the Tibetan alphabet that, there, that some human beings have a sensible alphabet. That they know, ka, 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 ka. That's the guttural sounds they put them together. And they even, it was a eureka moment for me at the age of 20 when I discovered that somebody knew that consonants make no sound. That all that is is <laughs> <laughs> And you have to have a vowel with that. And then I, U, A, O, you know? And then later Sanskrit, more elaborated, right? <laughs> you know? and, and here we are, supposed to great vast civilization, A, B, C. <laughs> And it's totally insane. It triples your intelligence as a child to have to go A, B, C, D, E, F, G, H, I, J, K, element of No wonder they're barbarians. There has no rhyme or reason. There's a vowel, there's a B, the culture has with different vowels. C is not C, it's K. And I mean, it's just completely cuckoo. It's backward. It's totally backward. And some of you know that linguistics as a science was invented by the discovery of, by the Germans and the Russians of Sanskrit. And then they found a higher civilization. Of course, they were conquering it and squeezing the wealth out of it and so on and acting colonialist and like the big bullies because of their backwardness. Even Europeans, I'm sorry, you Europeans, I'm sorry. <laughs> Don't think it's just us Americans who are barbaric. <laughs> you guys, because it's not your fault. You were born in the poorest part of Eurasia. <laughs> Bunch of trees and like weird guys and Vikings with axes beating you over the head. Battle of Hastings and really, you know, backward stuff. <laughs> and they had everybody had to work, you couldn't have any mystics. Somebody coming out demanding a free lunch was really a hard sell. <laughs> you know, with the bowl, you know. And the Protestants got back to reality, you know, and then no more monks, no more free lunch, and then population explosion and then conquered the world. <laughs> so, big mistake, the Reformation in a social sense, at least for the other people in the planet. Big mistake. Great for, great for the conquerors, as conquerors. But conquerors really are never happy. You know? They're never satisfied with what they conquer. It's not, it's not and only the, the conqueror of himself, that is the Jinnah. You know? that, that guy is happy, but not, not conquerors who conquer other people. They get more paranoid when they do that. So, okay, so I grew up hating the alphabet. <laughs> I went to St. Bernard's, I went to all good schools, a family of impoverished gentry. My father and mother had run away from redneck families in the back in the hinterland, living in New York and in the theater and like sort of like hippies of their day in the thirties and forties. And but impoverished, you know. But anyway, with scholarships I went to St. Bernard's, sort of waspy school, no girls, just boys learning Latin. And like they had a switch still, and when I was up to like fourth grade, you know, there was this the, the the passage to the headmaster's office was called the Babel Mandel, Straits of Weeping, because the, you could get slips in there if you acted up. <laughs> then Phillips Exeter, hey, you know, almost that over. Then, <laughs> then Harvard, you know, a National Merit Scholar in Harvard. But then some single went wrong, like my American programming still was incomplete. You know, I was a National Merit Scholar accepted as a sophomore in Harvard. Uh, you know, in my senior year at Exeter, and then just about three weeks before uh, graduation, a Mexican friend of mine and I, on a dare, left town, went to Miami Beach, 
to join Fidel Castro's revolution. <laughs> Some guys brought out pistols they had under their beds in Exeter, they gave them to us. And those days we were packing pistols on a plane, flew to Miami, and luckily the Cuban recruiters looked at us and laughed. <laughs> and they said, and my, I was uh, about 6'3", and weighed like 150 pounds. And my friend was 5'3", and weighed 170 pounds. <laughs> so they said, Don Quixote and Sancho Panza. You know, we, we don't really need you. And you know, without me, they said that blonde head will be blown off in five minutes. As my friend was a rich Mexican family, he was rebelling, you know, against a right wing Mexican family. So then we went to Mexico, and then they quickly separated us. And they sent him to be beaten up on a road gang so he could be re reculturated. And I had a fun time in, in Mexico for a, for a year. And then I got back into Harvard. Because, but I never got a diploma, I never joined the army, I didn't do anything. They didn't let me back into Exeter. They, they offered to let us back if we signed a paper that we were insane to run off to Fidel Castro, but we refused to do that. We said we were just idealistic and silly, but not insane. And, uh, but I remember the, the vision that I had, why I did it was, I could see the path of the American career, you know, Harvard, then maybe diplomacy, State Department, or literature or something. And just, you know, part of this elite and, 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 you know, running the world in their own direction, actually. Not understanding the meaning of life. I knew that. I was already studying Buddhism, reading it in college. And uh, I knew he just didn't have it right. But, you know, I probably, then I got back into Harvard. I got married really young. I don't know, I was, uh, I was a st stupid, probably. I fell in love, what the hell, did you want to get married? We did. And, um, Married an older woman, and then had a daughter. But then I lost my eye in a stupid accident. I was writing the ultimate one-act play about Fidel Castro, and because uh, I thought I was going to be a literary, literary guy, I read, that's where I first read Lama Govinda's Fundamental La Mystique Tibetan. You know, Eric said he couldn't find any Buddhist books, but in Paris in 1959, 1960, I found Fundamental La Mystique Tibetan, which was recommended to me by Gaston Bachelard, actually who I met in some cafe. And then I also read uh, Milarepa's life in English at the recommendation of Henry Miller. You know, I didn't have any gurus or anything, but then, then those two things really got me a little bit interested. But it was in Buddhism. Well, I wasn't still caught in the mystique of Tibet particularly. And then, uh, uh, so I, then I, you know, I, went, I went on back to, but in my senior year in Harvard, I decided this is too ridiculous. You know, my teacher of Shakespeare was a drunk. He would come in giving the lecture. And uh, probably it was a wise idea being in Harvard, and uh, and you know it just I didn't I think they had it together, and of course I didn't know how to use the great things that they did have there, but anyway then I left to go to India when I was 20 years old, and in, uh, in 1961, and I hitchhiked and so forth, and I was a fakir and looked I met Sufis and things on the way, and this, nothing held me though you know but although I learned my first frustration from Muslims in Sufi tikkas you know. How to do a full prostration? That I did learn. You know, la I can frighten you by saying, you know, la la la, monta la. I can do that, <laughs> and I kind of enjoyed it. But the problem with the Sufi gurus was that they were so full of their own glory and their luminosity that there seemed to be no room for you. <laughs> and then I got to India, and then in India I met the Tibetans in '62, uh, and the minute I met them, that was like homecoming. It's like great. I got a job. I would have been Trumpet Rinpoche's English teacher at Mrs. Bailey's school for young mamas in Dalhousie in '62. And you know, a lot of, many of you here have really had you know, learned from Trumpet Rinpoche. I would have been his English teacher, and I took that job. But then, just in the, as I was about to get on the train to Dalhousie from Delhi, uh, my father passed away in New York, and so I had to go back on a round trip to come back and take the job, and I, which I fully planned to do. And then I, um, while I was there for the funeral, in between that, I went down to New Jersey. And there in New Jersey, it's like, because I saw a sign in the Zen Center in New York, you know, like, you know, La Monastery in Freewood Acres, New Jersey, Lama looking for English teacher, etc. And I didn't plan to go there, to stay there. I just said, you know, we're traveling in Asia. I thought, they must have friends in, amongst the Tibetans in Dalhousie, Dharamsala, whatever. I'll take a package or a letter, you know, go meet them, you know, they live by New York. So then I went down to, uh, to uh, Freewood Acres and took us all day to find this funny place. Little pink tracked house 
in this uh, Russian sort of refugee colony in the airspace of Hangzhou. And Sherpa Tuku, Kamlo Tuku, Geshe Sopa, Pungar and Buche, who you all know from Berkeley. And they were all there. And, uh, but when I got there, I couldn't walk. I had like butterflies in my stomach. My knees were knocking. And I said to my friend who had spent, who was annoying, he'd spent a lot of gas money driving around looking for the place. And he, I said, let's go get out of here. I'll come back next week. I know my guru's in there. He said, what do you know that? I said, well, I can't, you know, I can feel it. It's like some amazing thing there. And he said, oh, come on, you know, what are you talking about? I said, yeah, I'm still smoking beanies. I can't go in there. I'm going to quit the beanies. Then I'll come back. He said, oh, come on. He dragged me out of the car. Then Sherpa and them came out. And Geshe Sopala, and they sweetly brought us in. And then uh, Geshe Wagyo, he was like, couldn't even speak. I usually tell, tell him, like, ah, I would tell different gurus, I'm like, I, I, blah, blah, blah. <laughs> and I, I couldn't even speak in the presence. And then finally I did get out some words, but I was thinking maybe I become enlightened, <laughs> something, find a higher self. And he, he says, oh, you never managed that, he said. <laughs> That's a difficult path, he said. And, you know, if you had come here without your friend driving you, if you tried to come on a bus, you would have been arrested. Look at you. I was wearing black Afghani pants. I had a weird shirt on. And uh, I had long hair, a straggly beard, and I didn't wear my false eye. And, and there were no hippies in those days, so they, whatever. You know, he was right. Said, so you can't even come from New York to Freeman Acres, New Jersey, without getting arrested. How do you plan to go to enlightenment? Difficult path. <laughs> uh, I was totally good. So then, so then, you know, he brought us a piece of pie, you know, and, uh, and we were eating the pie, and I was like this. And then, then he didn't curse, he said, well, you see those books over there, he said. And he, it was a, the living room of that little tract house, very poor little house, uh, had a, had a, you know, the Ganja or Benja there in a, in a stack, it had some sumbum something, you know, at the end of the room, and then there was a Buddhist statue, you know, and then the calming thing with little lights and things. He said, you know, I'm not like myself, he said. You know, I, I didn't make much progress, and I'm 60 years old, he said. But I did get some benefit reading those books. And I think you can get some benefit reading those books. And I'd be willing to teach you how to read those books, you know, if you, if you want. And exchange, but in exchange, you have to teach English to those little llamas who were hiding around, looking around the corner in that room. They just come from India. And I totally said, okay, I'll be back. And, and, and uh, I'll come back tomorrow. He said, no, well, you can't stay here in the monastery. He said, it takes time. I have to get to a house outside. You, you're not a monk, can't stay in the monastery. So I went, I went out, and my, my friend thought I was nuts. Because I had a ticket back to India. And my friend thought, Chris George, you know it. He said, I went, I went out and said, that's my teacher. I'm coming back tomorrow. Can you bring me? I'm going to go clean up and send me some jeans, you know, I'm going to look a regular American, get a t-shirt, and uh, shave my things, you know, put on my eye patch. I didn't have a plastic car at the time. And he said, what, are you insane? I don't know what to talk about. <coughs> why, why do you think, I, he, you, he's your teacher. I said, well, I know that because I can trust him, I said. And he said, well, how do you know that? And I said, because he's not there. He's not there for himself. Therefore, he will be focused on my, well, on me. And I didn't even know what it meant. It just came out, you know. Because he was, he was like that. He was not this kind of like, great thing, you know, big shot, you know. He wasn't. He was like, just there. You know? But this energy field was unbelievable. But many of you here knew Gitche Wangyo, and you know what I'm talking about. And yet he himself was self-effacing. Actually, that's the thing. His, that's what I think makes his holiness also so great.